December is a time of year where we get together with family and friends. We look back at the past successes and failures of the previous year, but more importantly, we look forward into the approaching new one. In keeping with this tradition, INET takes a look back at the top news stories of 2009. Two thousand and nine was one of the more interesting years, politically speaking at any rate, in recent memory. This was largely due to the U.S. presidential elections in November of two thousand and eight. In January oh nine, Barack Obama was officially inaugurated as forty fourth president of the United States and the first African American. Millions of people worldwide watched as Obama took the oath of office, and in an event that is not soon going to be forgotten, uh, Obama messed up at least part of his acceptance speech. Not to worry, though, Obama retook the oath of office in private to make sure that everything was nice and legal. Obama campaigned on a platform of change, and to date, he has focused most of his attention on the United States, attempting to close Guantanamo Bay, pushing health care reform in the U.S., and battling the economic recession. Unfortunately, though, as we are all aware, change doesn't happen quickly in America, and one can only hope that 2010 will bring more success to Obama's efforts. Another big political story of 2009, this one rocking Latin America, occurred in Honduras. On June 28th, former President Manuel Zelaya was forced out of power in a bloodless coup that was orchestrated by the military. In a rare move that saw the United States and Venezuela become likely allies, the world called on the interim government to reinstate Zelaya. The Honduran government responded with an election that was widely regarded as a sham, in which candidates supportive of Zelaya weren't permitted or were intimidated into not running. Iran, too, was a hotbed of political activity. In 2009, Iran held presidential elections that, not surprisingly, saw the re-election of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. This result was met by massive protests from supporters for the opposition candidate and saw some of the bloodiest days in Iran since the 1979 Iranian Islamic Revolution. And finally, in Zimbabwe, Morgan Changarai was officially sworn in as Prime Minister after a power-sharing agreement uh, was signed with Robert Mugabe, the current president who has held power since 1987. As we are all aware, nothing makes news stories like tales of death and destruction, and 2009 was no exception. The most dominant story at the beginning of the year was the Israeli invasion of the Gaza Strip. This most recent conflict between Israel and Hamas saw the death of over 1,000 Palestinians. Hundreds of homes, government buildings, and mosques were destroyed in the 22-day conflict. Israel is facing international criticism over how they handled both the conflict and the media who tried to report on it. On September 28th, over 150 protesters were killed in the African nation of Guinea. The protesters had gathered in a football stadium for a peaceful protest against the military junta. As the protesters were getting their events off the ground, they were cut down by heavily armed soldiers. Weather-wise, 2009 was a brutal year, especially for those living in the Asia-Pacific region. Australia saw some of the worst ever wildfires in February. Over 150 people were killed by the firestorm and about 500 injured. Australian fire investigators say that many of the blazes were caused by downed power lines or were deliberately set. The Philippines was rocked by storm after storm, the worst of which was Typhoon Ketsiana. Record-breaking amounts of rainfall were recorded, prompting the government to declare a state of calamity in over 25 provinces. In total, nearly 500 people were killed during the storm or in its immediate aftermath. 500 people were also killed in Taiwan when Typhoon Marakot struck that country in early August. Entire towns were flooded and over 1,000 people were left stranded by the rising floodwaters. Ironically, Marakot signified the end of a month-long drought and saw the lifting of water restrictions. Some news in brief now in 2009 was the end of an era of sorts when it comes to television in the United States. After delays and technological challenges, analog television transmitters finally went dark. The switchover occurred in late June, and for the most part, went off without a hitch. In June of 2009, Michael Jackson, the so-called King of Pop, passed away. Jackson supposedly died of a drug overdose, and his physician is currently being investigated. The death of Jackson saw an international outpouring of grief and a massive funeral service watched by millions of people around the world. Microsoft released their long-anticipated Windows 7 in October to much fanfare and excitement. Windows 7 is the first major release after the Vista disaster and is being heralded as a saving grace for the company. Windows 7 has been in development on and off since XP was released in 2002. 
Tony Parsons, longtime host of the BC TV News Hour in British Columbia, finally called it quits this year. Parsons announced his decision to retire at the end of the news on December 15th. Tony joined the channel in 1975 and reportedly hasn't looked back since. NASA launched its Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, a probe that was designed to crash into the moon. The probe did just that, and after months of analysis, NASA has concluded that there is water on the moon, albeit in frozen form. Finally, Walter Cronkite passed away on July 17th at the age of 93. Cronkite was dubbed the most trusted man in America and hosted the CBS Evening News for 19 years between 1962 and 81. If you don't remember too much about 2009, chances are you are going to remember the swine flu story. Since the initial outbreak, the swine flu has killed an estimated 9,000 people worldwide. The swine flu was declared an international pandemic by the World Health Organization in June of 2009. The spread of the virus started in Mexico, but due to global travel, it quickly spread to Canada and the U.S., and from then to the rest of the world. The swine flu saw Asian countries closing their borders to travelers from North America and mass paranoia worldwide. As 2009 comes to a close, the swine flu hasn't killed any more people than a normal flu season, so it would appear that the mass hysteria was unwarranted. The single largest, and the story that affected the most people in 2009, was of course the economic recession. The recession started in the United States in 2008 and has been responsible for thousands of job losses and hundreds of companies in financial trouble. As 2009 marched along, markets have slowly begun to recover. In fact, the Dow has reached and surpassed the 10,000 mark once again. Canadian and financial officials from other countries have officially deemed the 2009 recession officially over. However, we know that simply is not true. Although the economy is in a slow recovery, it will be some time before things return to the state that they were before the crisis took place. 2009 has been a very bad year for the news media. Newspapers have been dropping like flies. In fact, just this year alone, we've seen the closure of the Seattle Post Intelligencer and Colorado's Rocky Mountain News. The hugely popular Washington Post has been forced to close all of its American bureaus outside of DC and hundreds more newspapers worldwide are dealing with dwindling subscriber numbers and the loss of ad revenue. The television sector hasn't been immune to the economic recession either. This year, Equity Media Holdings officially went bankrupt, causing the closure of dozens of local television stations in the United States. In Canada, declining ad revenues has meant a dip in profits for our major broadcasters, causing them to close stations. CHCA Red Deer and CKX Brandon were the first casualties we shall see what 2010 brings to the media sector. When you think about it, 2009 was a pretty crappy year. The fact that 2009 was so crappy, however, means that next year will almost certainly be better. The economy is definitely in a recovery, and the closure of Guantanamo Bay and healthcare reform in the States is a real possibility. The 2010 Olympics are coming to Vancouver, and as always, there's hope for progress on climate change and peace in the Middle East. It is with these thoughts that I leave you this year, and I wish all of you the best in 2010. For INET, this is Christopher, reporting. And that's the way it is, Friday, March 6, 1981. I'll be away on assignment. Dan Rather will be sitting in here for the next few years. Good night.